happening on her short film. And uh, I think we will first play a trailer to her film. And In 1937, San Francisco-born Esther Ng directed her first feature film in Hong Kong, National Heroine. Although an American citizen, Esther made all of her 10 known features in Chinese, becoming recognized as the first directress of Southern China. I was looking at film reviews from 1941. One caught my eye, which was a review of a film called Golden Gate Girl. And I looked at the credits and it said directed by Esther Eng. And immediately I realized that I had stumbled across something very unusual because it was a, a Chinese language film made in San Francisco, uh, directed by a Chinese woman. <laughs> Mad Fire, Mad Love opened in San Francisco in 1949. This was Esther's last independent production. <laughs> In 1961, 42-year-old Xiu Yinfei and 47-year-old Esther collaborated on what proved to be the last film for both, Murder in New York Chinatown. In 1946, when asked by journalist Betty Cornelius if she had been nervous about beginning a career in the medium of which she knew virtually nothing, Esther answered, It just came to me. I don't know why. I just went ahead and I wasn't afraid of anything. I am the only one in our family interested in pictures. I wonder why. Okay, so now let's welcome Professor Louisa Wei and Xiao Yang to our COVID season.
Uh, are we interfering each other? Okay. Hi, Professor Wei. Hello, uh, Xiang. Yeah, is everything good? Can uh -huh. you hear me, Professor Wei? Yes. Cool, cool. Yeah, we know you are in New York now, right? And you went to Chinatown yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, we wonder, how do you think about the Chinatown in New York? Is, is it any difference with the Chinatown in other cities in, in like in the United States or overwide? In, well, uh, yeah. I, I went to the the, the so-called first Chinatown that he mentioned in the in the past film, and uh, then the, the Chinatown in Manhattan was the one with the longest history, and because I mostly uh, deal with the historical subjects, and so uh, I found that Chinatown was like a, like San Francisco Chinatown uh, was really rich with lots of history, and it also means that in China in that Chinatown you have like people of different class in there and not just new immigrants as presented in the past film uh, so there will be like uh, you know uh, the first one when uh, i went to was san francisco chinatown where i uh, discovered the story of esther in and um, then the, she from 1949 after she made uh, the last film she decided to move to new york and she opened the restaurant in uh, the Manhattan, the canal, like a uh, uh, Chinatown on uh, Powell Street. So yesterday we went uh, a, a bit filming again um, for Chinese media asking me about uh, you know, my documentary journey. So in um, uh, if you go to Canal Chinatown again, you could uh, visit like a, a 18 and 20 Powell and 20 and a half was like, a, you know, where a uh, Bobo restaurant uh, Esther Ng's first restaurant uh, was opened. And then she opened, of course, three restaurants. And now you go there, you see three hair salons in there. Yeah. Uh, and also there was a, the other thing um, that you mentioned was a language issue before. Um, so these new immigrant stories, sometimes it was like, a, uh, it's important, it's a lot of people. But then there's always the other aspect of it. Uh, Esther. Esther's father insisted that she got um, her Chinese right. So he insisted all his children going to Chinese schools. It was like a two to three hours after the regular daytime school in English school. So they, they have like a good mastery of Chinese. This is why like uh, when chances came along, Esther could actually go to Hong Kong and um, make a Cantonese language picture. Uh, if you don't have both languages, and then uh, it would be different. And but but of course, this would mean that um, you know Esther would be from a better family with the parents who understand the situation and all. And uh, Esther's father was a, a merchant, so they were not struggling like the new immigrant. And uh, you know, like because if the parents do not speak like uh, or help with the, the child who's learning Chinese in a um, not Chinese environment, it will be really hard. Uh, so, so for Esther, there was a still like a loss of a potential and uh, possibility to unlock, like she could become a filmmaker uh, instead of like, you know, just working the laundry and, uh, you know, watching, uh, working like the, the labor class uh, Chinese immigrants job, right? And so uh, that's what Golden Gate Girl is about. Because before that, uh, like, you know, most of the Chinese American history, um, I kind of recognize or had an impression with, was mostly about uh, the struggling of the Chinese labors. Yes, very interesting. From we start from the Chinatown, as as you have pointed out, the Chinatown is actually very unique for the Chinese immigrants. Like, uh, maybe China, uh, first generation immigrants that go gather Chinatown for English, and they want to their children to learn Chinese in Chinatown. So we we know China. Uh, China uh, Chinese immigrants go to Chinatown not only for food and laundry, but also for entertainment and education. And from your documentaries, we have already know that uh, people go there for uh, quantum opera and films. Uh, we, we know es Esther actually watched so many films uh, in the Chinatown. So we want to know what does Chinatown mean for the immigrants from China, in your opinion? 
Um, well, I was like, not really, like my film is not really like uh, the other film that was talking about the new immigrant Im like uh, experience, but rather it was like a, the Esther was third generation. Oh, uh, yeah, third. There was a big difference. Um, and when she was third generation and she understand, but then, uh, you know, her time was that because there was still the segregation, there was a, a Chinese exclusion law starting from 1882, hasn't ended yet. And that means that um, if you're a Chinese kid uh, growing up, you cannot really go much beyond the Chinatown. Uh, the, the few blocks and then you're, you're sort of like, a, you know, um, <laughs> You're, you're sort of like you, you go to school, your life is there, okay? You don't have, like, you can't go anywhere else. You can't marry anyone else, like uh, in a uh, different than your race. So there's a lot of a limitation. But then because Esther was, um, when she started a filmmaking, it was like at the end of 1935. And when she rented a studio from Hollywood, and she has her friend, the famous cinematographer, James Wang Hao uh, to help. And James Wang Hao was of course like recognized by all the Chinese American uh, filmmakers and he inspired all of them. He got one Oscar in black and white film and he got another one in uh, color. Um, so he, he was the one who helped to introduce some connections. So when they were making Hard X, uh, it was a Chinese cast with a Western crew of cinematographers, lighting person, recording, all technicians, they're all Hollywood. So this is a, like a real cross-cultural, uh, um, you know, production. Um, and after she took this to Hong Kong in 1936 and was shown, and both English media and Chinese media promoted it, the film, but the film was showed in Hong Kong's Queen's, uh, Queen's Theatre. And Queen's Theatre in Hong Kong was meant for Western pictures. And so uh, when you were mentioning Chinatown, Chinatown, I don't know if you realize that uh, even though Esther watched movies in Chinatown, but most of the movies she watched were Western movies, including lots of movies by um, Hollywood's woman director, Dorsey Osner. And I, I seriously think that Esther's hairstyle and dressing style was affected by Dorsey Osner because there was lots of uh, uh, media coverage on Dorsey Osner. And Dorsey Osner was the only woman director between 1929 when Hollywood um, moved to the, to the sound period, to talkies, and all the way uh, until Dorsey Osner um, retired in 1943. So in between these uh, 14 years, she was the only one, right? Esther couldn't just come by without noticing her. Um, so, so this was this was Esther's education, and so lots of people like when I first just started to make um, Golden Gate Girl, lots of people in Hong Kong, including lots of the film historians and critics, they said to me that why don't you have more of Esther in in Hong Kong? But we're looking through history. It's not that uh, you look for something you will, for certain you will find something, especially considering like Hong Kong was bombed by Japan. So lots of history just gone into fire. And um, so, so these, are, these are the things that uh, you would see Esther was a third generation, but she was crossing over to the China side because she couldn't have the opportunity to become, um, a filmmaker in Hollywood maybe, but then uh, she was using her cultural advantage to become Hong Kong's first woman director in Hong Kong, you know? Um, and so that was something that uh, she was very bold and that has uh, to do with her, like, uh, you know, uh, the vision and knowledge of the two cultures, because as soon as she arrived in Hong Kong, she know how to talk to the media. She was like, uh, you know, uh, me, I grew up in the US and then, uh, but in the future, I want to tackle into the sentiment of the Chinese audience and make a film for them. So this is a true spirit of a, a transnational like filmmaking or cultural venture, right? Yeah, so wonderful, wonderful 
story. Mm -hmm. um, actually, for me, I see so many similarities between Esther and you. Like you are, uh, you are a filmmaker with great passion, and you have cross-cultural working and education experience. We know you have worked in Hong Kong, uh, mainland China, Japan, Canada. I never worked in mainland China. Oh, really? Oh, sorry for that. <laughs> Uh, so you have cooperation with institutions in mainland China, but not working in mainland China, right? No, I don't have anything to do like in working relation, except for like a visiting or joining festivals as a filmmaker. Got it. Okay. I, I know it now. <laughs> you have never worked in uh, PRC, right? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so interesting. So um, I want to know if there are some uh, similar challenges for filmmakers as you as you have observed or experienced from like the age in the beginning of the 20th century to the nowadays. Any similar challenges for filmmakers? Similar challenges for filmmakers or for women directors? It's, uh, it's a very big question. Like you want to narrow yeah. down a bit because we're doing a women of a silent screen <laughs> conference here. Um, so you prefer we talk about the woman in the film? Well, because, because otherwise, like uh, I, I have to sort of, uh, I, I feel if in order to answer your question, I have to summarize the entire film history. Uh, because it's too broad and then you're talking about and of course money is always a challenge and um, but then uh, whether you are within the studio or without uh, like a independent it's very different Esther mostly work independently but uh, Dorsey Osner was like half half she was uh, with the Paramount studio for um for six years where she made 10 films. But when, once she was outside to be like an independent contract director, she used 10 years to only make six films. So, so that you could see that within the studio, you still have an, an umbrella and uh, protecting you. And then you still have your crew like, um, you know. And uh, what is interesting when I read into Dorsey Asner was that once she was out, out of the studio, Hollywood studio system, and uh, there were several times, I, I think there might be half of the six films she made was because the, the producers from the big studio just couldn't agree with each other with the, the director, the male director that they picked. So they were like, uh, how about we try this female director, you know? And uh, I find that's very interesting. But um, Esther didn't have that kind of uh, like a budget. So Esther, uh, when she was working in Hong Kong, um, the scale of the Hong Kong film production, because we we're almost at war at that time, and uh, they don't have lots of money. So uh, in the scale, she would work something like a Hollywood B movies, um, not big budget, like a very moderate budget. And uh, after she came back to the US, um, in 1939, late 1939, after World War II already broke out in, uh, um, in Europe, she was also making Chinese productions. And those were like a really moderate like budget. But then uh, how could you use a moderate budget and to make a film that doesn't look very cheap? So this is uh, the thing that, um, you know, it's a, a biggest challenge for um, all the independent filmmakers. Okay, and so so these are the things that I think uh, uh, women filmmakers and they would have like, um, of course, independent filmmakers are all very intelligent and smart, and then they could uh, resolve lots of issues. Um, and same with a documentary uh, documentary filmmaker. And people think documentary filmmaker, like nowadays, uh, because of the development of the independent documentary, so. Um, we would uh, call the film we just saw more like a, a TV documentary instead of a, like a, a, a feature documentary like Golden Gate Girls, um, because in the other film you sort of a, you you work more like a journalist. Your own voice was where is it? And of course, like uh, it's it's behind people's voices because you're the editor. You put these material together, but then the uh, uh, the purpose was to give voice to that, but. 
for me, the biggest challenge of making Golden Gate Girl was that uh, even though I was lucky enough to get 600 photographs of uh, Esther's film, Esther's personal albums, etc., but Esther didn't have moving image and Esther didn't have recordings. So where's Esther's voice? Uh, this is why, like, uh, you know, uh, when I was asked to write a piece in English to reflect upon my filmmaking um, uh, challenges, and uh, I wrote an article called uh, Finding Voices in Images. Um, and, you know, and because at that point I was thinking, oh, uh, even in my personal, like, a uh, family, in my family album, there were these women. Right, and uh, you look at their dress, and then they change very much, and then it just from the closing, they're from a different time, uh, but they don't have a voice. So I think like it, this is like a women's situation in general. Like uh, you, you, and then you become curious. You want to give back her her voice. This is why like I dig this through all the try to find the interviews with uh, English media, Chinese media. But very seldomly, because people didn't do our history at that time. So uh, they would have the writer absorb the information, rewrite the whole piece, sometimes without even using one line in direct speech. But direct speech is something very important to make me feel that I can hear that person, how that person talk, what kind of a vocabulary that uh, she is using. And what kind of a, did she has like a, a flair, like a, a, a huspa or like a, you know, did she have some kind of a spirit that comes with a language, right? So, so it's very interesting because we find uh, two pieces in um, uh, both by Seattle journalist and one uh, by Betty Cornelius, who was writing for, who's a woman, direct, uh, woman journalist writing for Seattle Times. And then we have, um, a column writer, uh, David Lynch, and uh, he was writing for uh, Seattle Scene, which is a column in uh, the Seattle Post uh, uh, Intellexia, I think. And so, um, so they both had uh, some like a direct quotes from from Esther, right? So, um, so I included all these quotes into my film and uh, inviting. Uh, voice actor or uh, voice actress to sort of like reproduce this. And there's only one piece in Chinese, um, but it wasn't a direct quote. It was a quote from a letter that Esther wrote to this editor of the, the journal that published the piece. So I quoted that also in, uh, in Cantonese. And so, so this is like, a, you know, how you thinking of uh, making a film, a film is a medium with both the soundtrack and the visual track. So you need to fulfill both audio and visual um, evidence for whatever you are talking about. Right. Exactly, so interesting, Professor Lee. Uh, sorry, Professor Wei. Um, actually, I personally, I love the design at the beginning of the Golden Gate Girls that we start from the, the, we start the story from your voice, your voice over. And I think it, uh, this design shows your trace in the um, process of collecting the, uh, the historical material. It's all very honest. And I also know such a kind of design is controversial that uh, some audience disagree with uh, such a design. Would you mind to share us uh, why did you have such an idea to put yourself, yourself's voice in the documentary? Well, this was like, a, you know, I, I, was, I wasn't filming myself because when I uh, started a film project, I usually have no budget. And um, then uh, I was there with my camera. And so I was like a one, one woman band, right? And uh, I have no image of myself. So in the first sort of five version of Golden Gate Girl, you don't see me and you don't hear me either. And so, um, but when I was showing this to my friends and to my colleague in Hong Kong, and then they started uh, like, hi, Louisa, why we're watching such a film? Why we're watching the life of Esther In? And they all suggested, uh, you know, one common uh, suggestion I get from lots of people, lots of friends was that I should step in and to be the tour guide, to take the audience on a journey 
and to find uh, a piece of history that gone lost, um, you know, in the middle of the time. So, so I thought, then, then I thought, oh gosh, I don't have like much image of me. And, uh, you know, like, uh, uh, luckily that uh, the second trip we went to New York and I already got the funding so I can bring a camera woman with me. So she would uh, like uh, film me in uh, funding people in New York. And uh, the next, also in between, I was able to go back to California. So I could uh, like, uh, you know, the, the redo a few like a selfie kind of like a video shot uh, so that I could insert this into, into the narrative. Yeah. So and, interesting. Yeah. Um, actually we have a, if, if I can check out, I watched the clip of Xiao Jing Liu Ji, and actually, in the, uh, we we hear the recording of Xiao Jing that yeah. it and in your documentary, we see you pay much attention to the audio recording. Audio recording as a, a historical document document is very valuable. So um, I wonder, in your documentary, you think which type of uh, material is of the is uh, most valuable, and uh, which type of material is is both to be uh, saved in the form of documentary? Uh, well, you uh, uh, your, the question you asked it was mostly from like a film study uh, person's perspective, and. Um, um, all the things I included in my film are the most valuable. Uh, but then uh, when you're looking at the original material with interviews and with things that you found, they are all very scattered. Uh, but it's from these pieces that you get a sense of the time that you're working on, the person, the community that you're working on, and uh, then the, the important uh, um, of this person and the events uh, in in it, so uh, I I actually asked my um, uh, in one of the earlier version I asked my my mentor for my editing and uh, who is a um, a Hollywood editor and his name is Robert C Jones and so he he worked when he started and he was really a veteran uh, editor he, when he started with some like it hot or 1970 like love story and he's a feature film um, editor mostly um, so I asked him I said how could I make um, you know like a story like Esther Ng be interested by an international audience because that's that's my ambition, right? I'm not making the film for a particular audience. And he said, uh, World War II. He said World War II was like, a, you know, the event that's known by uh, all generations because World War II was so widely covered by, um, you know, all countries. And they were reported, people watch it during the war, after the war, and now they were still going on. Like every year you have a, like a World War II film come up somewhere. So that's the background, like people uh, were kind of familiar. So when you, um, when I do this Esther in growing up story, and then there was also the World War II uh, in the background. And then I realized like, uh, you know, people like uh, uh, Mei Ling Song or Madame Chiang Kai-she, China's first lady and uh, uh, famous Nobel Prize winning uh, writer Pearl Buck. And they are all transnational uh, women. And uh, they all play a part, very important part in World War II. So when I uh, include these women in there and people who are familiar or not familiar with uh, film history, they wouldn't know where they are. And then, then it makes, makes sense to see how like, you know, it's not easy for Esther and Anime Wang to have their transnational journey, ocean crossing, because lots of people never traveled anywhere, never traveled beyond the, the their original continent, right? So that was that was how like only when you're providing this background, and then the, then you realize uh, how wonderful these women are, and uh, you know um, how you know how brilliant that they could do certain things. Yes, yeah, so interesting. Actually, 
well, I watched, uh, you have so many documentaries and I have watched uh, Havana Davis and the Golden Get Girls. And I watched getting, uh, Golden, Golden Get Girls on Billy Billy. And you tell me that that is parody. It's not the uh, formal published uh, version. So I wonder- uh, It's not like exactly, it's my own parody and I own the film. So it's not exactly a parody for the, for the Chinese version, but the original version was in English. Got it. So we also know you have some cooperation with online uh, streaming platform like Tesla, uh, and they will uh, uh, they were in charge of the online distribution of some of your uh, films. Um, um, I, I know uh, with the with the benefiting from the efficiency of internet, the broadcasting has been very quick. But however, we we'll, we will also deal with some issues like piracy, as you I mentioned. I watch on Bilibili, but it's your own piracy. So I want to know uh, in which ways is uh, is the streaming platform changing the uh, distribution and communication of the documentaries for you and for the streaming platform that you are cooperating with? Um, well, I think like, uh, you know, the way you talk about Cassie Play as a corporation <laughs> was like a, something I never thought of. And because you make a film, you want more people to see it. And now lots of the uh, younger people are uh, like only doing streaming and not even owning a DVD or a DVD drive. Uh, but then uh, uh, since DVD still exist, so the DVD market and the streaming market were different. Mm -hmm. You have like uh, people watching uh, documentaries on different media. So my film was also like, uh, you know, on paid TV in Hong Kong by Movie Movie. And um, so people who subscribe Movie Movie, they can watch it there. Uh, but if you want to pay a few dollars to watch it on Cassie Play, go ahead, register yourself. You could do it, right? And then we do a share. This is a, a this is like how distributor work. But Cassie Play, um, the reason why I give it to it because it was it was a new it was new it needed support and um, uh, because it's devoted to documentary so this is why I I give it to Cassie Play rather than a big corporation like a uh, um, Tencent or like a you know like I I give it to ITE before but but because like for some reason they just stop it and then uh, I didn't deal with them directly. So uh, that wasn't a good experience because we have like some 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 somebody in the middle, and so I thought like you know the um, my purpose is to get my work directly to the audience the easiest way they could do. So um, women make movies is uh, like a you know a long time distributor uh, with a good reputation in uh, North America, and uh, they targeted at uh, at the educational market which I value very much because that's how like, uh, you know, my film reached to students like you, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I guess like uh, we have 25 minutes left, right? Um, yes. We, yeah. could, we could perhaps invite questions, I think. Okay, I will. Yeah. We, because... have a, we have a question in the chat. Yeah. From, from Isabel. Okay. Um, well, uh, this, this is like, uh, you know, I think the biggest tip is not to rush because when you are on your first film and, um, uh, then, um, you, you basically have, um, no clue what you're doing and you have difficulty in each step. So you, you could uh, do like a choose a really small subject and then a completed first. When you are doing the editing, you will find, okay, my camera work has lots of problem. Next time when, I, when I'm shooting something, I will pay attention to get myself more B-rolls. And so it's from like completing the small one and then, then you have some experience and then you could work on the, uh, but of course, if you could ask somebody to give you their feedback, then that would be like a really, really important. Yeah, even me, like, uh, you know, I, you, you heard like a, a Golden Gate Girl has 500 uh, audience member watched it before I finalize uh, the version that is like, you know, the final version. It's because I was I was there like uh, observing my audience, see if they're falling asleep. 
see if they fall out of the, the narrative timeline somewhere and getting distracted. Because when these things happen, it means that uh, you know my editing job can still have room to improve. And also music and the sound was really important for like um, uh, the, the new, new for documentary director, not only new, there was some, some very old, like uh, some, some very experienced um, um, documentary director also didn't do very well with their sound recording. But nowadays to see, because everybody can record with their phone. And uh, so whether sound is good matters more perhaps than even the visual. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? You could like, I, I guess people can open their mic and just ask or, or you long you want to repeat. Oh, if there is no question from audience, may I have another question, Professor Wei? Sure. Yeah, we, we, we see there uh, your scholar work and your documentary is highly relevant. There are so many topics that you are interested in both documentary and scholar work, like um, uh, immigration and migration. So we, uh, we want to know for you, what is the relationship between your scholar work and documentary film? Um. Well, when I started to make documentary and I I said somewhere else, it was like it was like doing another PhD when you're making a documentary because you kind of stumble into a new area and then then you started to read uh, the books and background information about this area. So for each documentary I read like somewhere between 100 to 300 books and um, to make sure that you know, I understand everything like, uh, you know, mostly most correct, uh, not all correctly, but then, uh, you know, like uh, I get like a better sense of thing because only, only when that happens, when I interview somebody, when they drop a name, when they drop a name of a person, when they drop in the name of a restaurant, I could click. Otherwise, I just like wouldn't catch that when I was doing the interview and I couldn't do a follow up question. And lots of the time, uh, these interview needs travel and it needs money to travel. And then you have limited resource in, in doing this. And then so you have to be like really well prepared when you're when you're doing this. And you have to be quite alert. You have to like uh, be able to react, and you have to be uh, able to read people's face and to see uh, if they're particularly interested in one of your questions. Just encourage them to say more, and then you would have like a, a very interesting answer coming up. So these are all the all the tricks I used, and um, and when you go through a research like this, and then you would have like uh, lots of lots of materials that cannot be used in your film because your film is like 90 minutes or like 120 minutes. Uh, we're talking about like um, 90 minutes. Imagine it was like, a, a, it's only like a 30,000 words or 20,000 words depends you're talking about English or Chinese. And so it's not much. But then the, what happened to the other material I found so interesting, rather than try to squeeze them into the film, I would write a book. And the, the book can accommodate uh, what's in the, in the film and what's not in the film. And then the, the book and the film become something like a, a remediation at the same, same time, a cross reference to each other. And this kind of a subject, they're peculiar. They were like a not so widely circulated. So I think it's very important for like a younger student like you and sometimes write like about films that you like, you know, on your personal media and on like, you know, some, some other media as well, like public media as well. And then it's very important for we to cross reference to each other. So History back to the the big history, and this is this is my biggest goal. So if you like, if I'm an activist, and that's my activism, you know, it's a Sydney feminism. It's a, that's my activism, basically. Yeah. So interesting. So is another. Yeah, we have another question for you, Professor. Okay, I need to read. This is my optical glass, and not just. Ah, uh, it's so yeah. cool.
Um, I think the, the the Hollywood female Asian directors were doing pretty well because uh, I used to not be able to see even one film in a whole year. And now I could uh, like uh, regularly see a couple of films um, every year. And um, I take my daughter to to see those films. And uh, I think like, you know, uh, in 2016, I was, uh, no, in 2010, I was in Vancouver and uh, in a, like a, a big meeting and where I see like a, a Gina Davis. And Gina Davis um, was of course was um, a Hollywood actress and she was promoting um, women make movies. And uh, she said something which I thought really important. She said like, you know, I, I want my daughter to grow up and to be able to see positive women's images on the big screen. So that, uh, you know, uh, and this was like a really important and it, it not automatically, but then, uh, you know, like a, a lot of the time, most of the time it came along uh, with women directors, women screenwriters and, uh, you know, talented uh, like uh, female stars who interpret them. So I was like really happy to see Little Woman and to see uh, Norma Land and uh, to see like, uh, um, you know, the, also the DC films and the Marvel films. And then, I, you know, I would see them. Um, those are like uh, women were really having like more opportunities than before. So now it's not like, a, you know, like about more women directors. There are lots of uh, women directors uh, out there. You just need to give them the job. That's what they talked about uh, in their interviews as well. So interesting. We have another question from Rita. Uh, thanks for your talk and film, Jeff watched First Ladies of Shanghai in Perverse Section. Would you mind talk a, little, a bit about the research process for that film, First Ladies of Shanghai? Uh, we were, for, for that particular film, we actually started from the paper research. We started to look through all the old newspapers and magazines from Shanghai that are already digitized. Uh, because images were so hard to find for, for them because uh, they were early. And then later on, as like a more and more like um, periodicals were digitized and we found more images from all different sources and we need to recreate them. And because most of the images were black and white and then they were of very bad quality. So, so we have to use some artwork, like we have to redraw the photo of Xie Cai Zhen and to color it. And we colored the Wang Hanlun photo and we colored the, and so, so this, this is also like, of course we have new tools that we could use. So we could do this and to bring them to bring them to life. Um, and we're, for me it was like, a, you know, I, I was paying lots of attention to the interrelations among the women, like, a, like I just said, yeah. Um, it seems we don't have question now, but I have another question, may I ask now? Of course. Yeah, I, according to my understanding, you focus, uh, you are very interested in different screening events for the documentary. And at the end of the Havana Davis, you even at the premiere of the documentary in your, doc, in your documentary, like final version. So I wonder for, for you, why are you so interested in different kind of screening event? Um, yeah, may I have your opinion? Why am I always interested in women's? Uh, screening event, uh, the screening of the documentary, like what we do, screening and Q and A and the, like the um, conversation with audience. That's what I do, right? You're a filmmaker. <laughs> and uh, when you're not making the film, you're showing the film. Yeah. And uh, for me it was because, um, I have things that I want people to know, and I have messages that I want to deliver. And attending these events would um, uh, be giving me opportunity to have like a direct uh, a, a chance of communication. Um, it's today the seventh, like a, a, a day before yesterday, I had two screenings. I had uh, one screening of Havana Divas in um, in the Brooklyn Chinese community. And so these like older generation, sort of like, uh, you know, the people who come out of uh, Professor Lee's film, and then they were they were watching, um, um, uh, of course, most, most of them speaking Cantonese. And then uh, uh, they, were, they were watching this film and then they were like 
feeling amazed by uh, you know what's what's going on in the film. They found that, that story, uh, but then uh, then I had another screening in um, in Chinatown, and. In that Chinatown, because I we were doing the screening in a church, and uh, this church was a uh, twenty-one pile. I showed my film there. I almost regarded it as my own community, and um, I met a um, Chinese American photographer, Corky Lee, who uh, unfortunately um, passed away, like uh, you know, like not long ago. He was the one who suggested uh, using uh, twenty-one pile as a location films that's related to Chinese Americans. So I showed the film there. And then there were four ladies who immigrated from Cuba. And they show up and then say, I used to live in Cuba. My grandpa was still buried there. And then there was one woman who even point to a photo on her phone and say, look at this photo that was used in your film. And this guy here is my father. And so this is how like, uh, you know, uh, some history, the recent history were still alive. And you could show a film and then you have people coming to you. And for me, it was like the most wonderful moment that, that people come around and say, you know, look at this, like, uh, this is how much she showed me that one picture and I understand how important that film is to her because she only have a few images and I constructed the whole background of a piece of history. Yeah, and that's like how much work you need to do, right? Yes, it's so interesting. You mentioned the smart phone and we, we know that you have workshop in Hong Kong to teach people how to make videos with smartphone, right? Yes, and you with have... iPhone particularly on the iPod store with iPhone and iPhone apps. It's yeah. so interesting. So you are a professional film director, a professional uh, documentary filmmaker, and you are teaching uh, some amateur film director. So I'm wondering if the, this part of, we, can we see they are potential film director or how their participation uh, will influence what is documentary like in the future? I guess for each of you, and if you're not like a, a doing, um, of filmmaking as a career, you could be the photographer of your family to start with and to study how to make an image look good. And when you're taking a photograph and how, how can you coordinate people, you can start from that. And then when something interesting happened and you pick up the phone to record it and uh, your instinct is to record it uh, vertically, but then uh, try record it horizontally so that uh, you would have like a, a bigger scope of the things that you recorded in. Of course, people were like playing with vertical screen and I remember like the recent uh, Cui Jian, like a concert was on WeChat, were watched by 46 million people. It was on a vertical screen, right? Uh, no, we're not used to that, but then uh, these things are coming around. And um, so you could try all these different things and be the person to, to document the important uh, moments in your in your family to start with, yeah, or so among your friends, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's so interesting. Yeah. It's that exactly what is happening around us. We have very uh, best photograph among the friends uh, who is good at taking pictures and uh, she or he will take pictures for the party. And we appreciate that. Yes. And we know we know you are uh, you are not uh, not only uh, scholars, um, uh, filmmakers. You are also professors. You have uh, taught like thousands of students. You, you teach them how to fil make films and how to write thesis. So we're wondering, according to your experience, is there any difference between different generations of students? Different generations of students. You know, you know. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, like, I, I guess the biggest thing is uh, this, like, habits of reading reduced from my early student to the current student. But I think that's like a, a global thing that uh, every professor is facing. Uh, when I toured America this time, because uh, New York is my fifth stop, and I went to four different uh, cities and 
in uh, three of them, I see um, professors, and then they were all having like a, you know, same same issues because people absorb. Um, I think the reading culture is still uh, important because if you don't read, uh, your brain cannot process large amount of information than data. You you kind of like uh, because when you only read from social media and from your phone and. Uh, the, the, the way that you absorb information, you form into a habit that you, it, it become too fragmented. I think uh, this is like a movie. This is why like people enjoy uh, everywhere, every time, like all, all at the same time, right? Every, everywhere, everyone, everyone, we're all at the same time, this kind of movie with multi-universe and then they could quickly react to that because that's part of their, their reality as well, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's so interesting that um, we are waiting for the last questions from the chat. Really, no questions? Yeah, please ask. Please ask I usually them. have lots of questions. <laughs> yeah, maybe they are shy and they want to listen instead of asking. So if anyone want to speak with Professor Wei, we are very welcome and we could admit you to. Yeah, talk. you're 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 welcome to to add me on your social media and then uh, you could uh, like, uh, you know, on Facebook, I'm on Twitter and I'm on Instagram. I, I don't I don't like uh, use other like I use Facebook more, but then uh, I'm also on like a uh, Weibo and Douban. It was all like a uh, you know in my real name. So and uh, nobody tried to pretend to be me. I'm not that famous. <laughs> so <laughs> I guess you could drop me a question somewhere like uh, you know like on those as well. Yeah. Well, we still have some minutes. Maybe we can have a marketing job for the professor with new documentary. And Columbia University will buy this documentary very quickly, and Columbia students could watch it by borrowing it from the library. And we cannot watch it online, but maybe sometime later, right? Oh, wow. Yeah. So Lin want to ask question. I'm very curious and look forward to your next project. I'm wondering if okay. you can tell us a little bit about your next project. Uh, well, and I could answer the next question as well. And uh, I used lots of animations in my film. It was because there were lots of things that couldn't be found. And um, so let's say you found a photograph, but it didn't have your, your subject in the photograph. And then so you could recreate uh, the background with uh, like uh, the, the time of the photo and then you could uh, put your um, subject in front of it. So so I love doing those. And uh, those were like, a, you know, sort of a bring your subject uh, from nowhere to a uh, more foreground. And I usually work on like uh, multiple projects, but the, the projects I work like the longest was the Cui Jian project. You probably read it. And I thought I was going to have it like uh, somewhere around the, the 15 years of making that film because I started from 2005. And um, I edited a version, but then, uh, then it, it has like uh, some issues, so it couldn't come out yet. But I already write a piece called uh, like 30 years of uh, filming Cui Jian. But this year was already my 17th years of filming him. And um, then he, he was like still giving me surprise. And I usually work on historical subject and then uh, the main subject already passed away. Havana Divas was the first film that uh, both ladies are still alive. And Cui Jian was, of course, he's more energetic, he's younger, and he's still like doing a lot of new stuff. And so, um, so I thought that that would be uh, the challenge in that. And how could you tell the story when this person is still alive? Uh, the people who are not alive, they cannot talk back to you anymore. So <laughs> I guess uh, that's another thing. So yeah. So I, I, I hope Sui Jian is my next film coming up. But you know, who knows? <laughs> Interesting. So any questions? We have three minutes left last time. Oh, wow, cool. Professor Harris, I have a question. Um, 
it seems like several people were leaving the company. One hundred for sure. Was that due to some a larger issue with the company at that time, or just a common system? Uh, the Hanlun company. Sorry, Xiaoyang. Yeah. Uh, could you read the read the? Was it like a uh, Professor Harris? Oh, the company, Great Wall Company. Oh, the, the Great Wall Company. Okay. Um, Great Wall Company actually didn't last very long, and um, uh, I think by it didn't even last into the nineteen thirties, and it's completely in a in a silent period, as far as I remember, and um, uh. Pu Xunqing and Hou Yao left for like a, a Mingxing Film Company because uh, they were a couple and they worked with uh, Great War for, for some time. And maybe like Mingxing was having more interesting uh, project. Um, you know, people do this all the time that they leave one company for, for the other because of a difference or because of other interest, interesting project. And also because Hou Yao was, um, from a Cantonese person, like a Cantonese family. So he spoke Cantonese. And uh, after he joined uh, Mingxing and he, he later just moved to Hong Kong and you know, have a, um, a longer relation with um, the Hong Kong film companies and making Cantonese language pictures as well. Yeah, does that answer your question, Christian? Okay. Thank you, Professor Harris. So it's, I guess it could be our last question and it's a very dense discussion. Thank you so much for Professor Wei. We know you have presentation this morning. It must be tired. It's a busy morning. Thank you so much for your sharing. Uh, thank you, everybody. I'm so happy to see all the people and all my friends here and, uh, you know, hope to join your uh, conference again another time. Yeah. Yes, thank you, Professor Wei. Yeah, thank, thank you, Xiaoyang, and thank you, Yulong. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you, and thank you all the audience from the chat, and we appreciate the uh, interesting questions from you. Okay, so we are going to have our panel two, and panelists, I'm going to make you uh, panelists and be prepared to share your videos.